Hi, I'm Brandon Leonard with Men's Health Network, and I'm in Washington, D.C. at the Dialogue on Men's Health series discussing initiatives and strategies to improve men's and boys' health across the lifespan. And today I'm speaking with Dr. Rick Bothwell. He worked for 37 years at the Indian Health Service and recently has spent a couple of years working with the Office of Minority Health as well as Men's Health Network on issues uh, particularly related to uh, Native American men's health. And he's been working as part of the Dialogue on Men's Health series since the beginning. So welcome, Dr. Bothwell. Thank you. Pleasure to be here. Please call me Rick. Okay, Rick. <laughs> Thank you. Um, I wanted to start out by asking you a question related to the Affordable Care Act. And in the ACA, there was the reauthorization of the Indian Health Care Improvement Act. And one section authorized the Indian Health Service to establish offices uh, dedicated to women's and men's health um, in the Indian Health Service. Could you tell me a little bit about why you think that was uh, necessary and what do we need to do to implement? Um, very interesting question and one that I am pretty familiar with because one of the last things I did before I left the Indian Health Service was to work on a strategy for implementing that. And uh, the Indian Health Care Improvement Act is, is a bellwether mark in Indian history, at least it was expected to be, because it was originally passed in the 70s and it, it resulted in an infusion of a lot of resources and then the funding slid. And so this was sort of re-energizing something that Indian people felt very passionate about. They were very active in formulating the law and uh, it's a very comprehensive, it deals with a lot of things that we've learned over the years in Indian country that were lacking in terms of Indian Health Service support, uh, and none of which, nonetheless, was you know the need for focus on both women's and men's health. Now we had in the Indian Health Service maternal and child health programs for years. We have a, a women's health consultant. There was not an office form for women's health, but there was you know certainly women's focus. There was nothing for men. And so I was part of a team, I was sort of a utility public health infielder and mentor, a performance management consultant uh, and public health advisor in the Office of Clinical and Preventive Services the last couple of years I was with the Indian Health Service. And I got, I sort of volunteered to be on the team. We were, there was an implementation team for the Indian Health Healthcare Improvement Act. And so I volunteered for looking at the appropriateness of this Office of Indian Men's Health. And as a good public healther, the first thing I did is try and understand and define the problem more fully to see. And you know, I consider myself a competent public health person. I've done a variety of jobs in terms of performance management and planning for all the disciplines. And I was absolutely blown out of the water how I had underestimated the magnitude of the health disparities for Indian men. And part of it is because so many of the documents that we had back then did not do gender split outs. Mm -hmm. Uh, we talked about diabetes and suicide. We always clump both genders together. And when I started digging into the data and getting sort of at the gender level, I was like absolutely shocked because it was dramatically worse than anything I'd ever seen. Some of the examples were uh, mortality rates from two to 500 percent greater for things like suicide, uh, injuries, diabetes, uh, alcohol-related deaths, uh, and I think I mentioned unintentional injuries, I mean, two to five hundred percent, that's two to five times greater than, than, than Indian women or, or females, and it's like, I mean, that's, that's shocking. It was also 10 to 50 percent greater for cancer, for uh, cardiovascular disease, and liver disease. So it's like we have these huge problems that have always been, you know, quote, Indian problems, but particularly suicide, which was the one that actually was the most shocking to me, was hugely one-sided men. And in fact, if you look at the younger age cohorts, uh, suicide is the number one cause of death for everybody, for the males, for uh, anyone from 10 to 34 years of age. Number two cause of death. And in the youngest cohort of from 10 to 24, it's four times greater than Indian females. And in the next cohort from uh, 25 to 34, it's almost five times greater. So it's like, it, it just blew me away. And it's like, I, I, I was absolutely amazed that I had never really heard that. We'd never really talked about it much in any of the planning meetings or anything. And so I started digging deeper. It's like, what is driving this? You know, how can we have such a disparity around something that is as tragic as suicide? And there was a report that came out just that spring in 2010, the same year the ACA passed, 
that looked at Indian health disparities uh, from the National Health Interview Survey that CDC collects. And in that study, they look at uh, all kinds of self-reported problems and there's a six question uh, psychological disparity uh, questionnaire. And in the Indian population, it's the, it is the only racial group where men rate higher on psychological distress than females. All other ones, the females are higher and like in Hispanics, it's dramatically higher. It's dramatically higher in, uh, in African Americans as well. And it's like, wow, I mean, what's going on here? And then I split it out by the very components of the six questions, and there was two questions that stood out when you analyzed those separately by gender and race, that Indian males were off the scale compared to anybody else, and it related to how often they felt helpless and how often they felt hopeless. And I began my career at Pine Ridge back in the 70s, which at the time was the poorest county in the United States with the lowest life expectancy of any place in the Western Hemisphere except Haiti, and right on the heels of the wounded knee experience. And I walked in there as a white boy out of a all-white high school that went to Indiana University uh, and then to dental school, and I was a clinician there. And I was just amazed at sort of the, the difference in terms of the, the role of women that worked in the hospital or any, in, in any kind of the enterprises. They were overwhelmingly outnumbered the men. And there was this pattern that I noticed that w of, of sad eyes, I would call it, and starting with boys in junior high and all the way through to the old people, not all of them, but far more so than any of the women. And it's like I did not understand that at the time, and I have a certain amount of guilt and, and sadness that I was ra rather probably judgmental because it's like, you know, get it together, guys, what's the problem? You know, a lot of alcoholism, and I, I wasn't harassed very often. I had a couple encounters with intoxicated but it was just more this sort of dropping out sadness and uh, you know I, I just labeled them as incompetent and, it, it, and, and 35 years later I started you know after a lot of experience and training and everything else I see these data and it just like kicked me right in the face and it's like my god that's what's going on these people are absolutely helpless and they feel worthless for whatever life has done to them, certainly the, the kind of life I haven't had to experience. And it really sort of changed what my focus was going to be the rest of my career. When I did that, it's just like, you know, I need to do something about this. It, even if it's only shine the light on it and make awareness, it may take years to change, but that's what I wanted to do. And as a result, uh, I then sort of jumped ship because the Indian Health Service, well, we actually proposed, I'll, I'll, let me back up just a second, we proposed a way to do this where we could do it with minimal resources because there was new, no new money coming in at the time. And I guess one of my biggest disappointments in the Indian Healthcare Improvement Act is from, if I was an Indian person, I would say, well, here's another broken promise because we have a nice piece of legislation that we worked our tails off on that's articulate, it's clear, it's focused on real needs, it's focused on reasonable resource levels, and by and large, the funding to make it happen has been totally uh, not coming forward. It's, you know, it's lip service. If you don't fund it, it's just, it's on paper, a great idea, but there's no new resources to do it. And so the huge disparities and the fact that Indians are funded at about the same, about half the level of the Bureau of Prisons, uh, that's a, a resource problem that's difficult to overcome and we can't do much with new programs uh, with no money. And so I actually left the Indian Health Service because it was clear that we proposed a model that only required one and a half FTE, um, and it was going to be sort of an entrepreneurial model where we would use that office to look for resources and research and other agencies to try and get other agencies as they're supposed to, to pony up their resources for Indian related problems. It's not all the Indian Health Service's uh, burden. It's a federal government to government relationship with tribes and the other agencies do need to pony up and, and provide their services to these citizens as well. And it was clear that the, the IHS leadership was overwhelmed with, you know, funding shortfalls. And you know, in fairness to everybody there, it's like when you have this put on your plate with no new money, it's an unfunded mandate. And how do you do it? What are you going to cut to make this happen? Uh, my perspective was for a $4 billion agency, you can find one and a half FTEs 
to start the process to focus attention around this because the consequences of, of neglecting it any longer and its impact on Indian communities, because that was the thing that was the most overwhelming is if you looked at how much money we spent, I did analysis even like on just head injuries and trauma from, from alcohol and it was overwhelmingly male related and the cost for dealing with that from contractors. So it was penny wise and dollar foolish to ignore men's health any longer, from my opinion. Um, and so we, uh, I had an opportunity to go to work at the Office of Minority Health on health disparities, part of the National Partnership for Action to End Health Disparities. And I thought, maybe I can get an audience there around men's health. And in fact, we were able to do it, the, the, the acting, or she was actually the, the deputy at the time, uh, Mirtha Beadle, when I shared these data with her and, and sort of told the story of Indian men's health and the neglect, said, my gosh, we need to do something about this. And so she carved out some money for us. And then there was changes in leadership and she left and it's like they had a multiple false starts, but it, it, it eventually led to the opportunity to reconnect with the men's health network. Because I'd actually met with Scott, who was your former vice president, back when we were looking at it in the Indian Health Service as a way, that, that office of Indian men's health. Um, and you guys were very supportive of it. Uh, so I reconnected with the Men's Health Network with resources of this new task order to look at uh, American Indian Alaska Native. And then it got expanded to males of color uh, health disparities. And uh, that was in the fall of 2012 when you were planning the first dialogue. And uh, I mean, that was a profound experience for me to sort of hook into that. And I got tied into writing the paper and uh, and that led to sort of this, here's, a, here's a, a group of people, that dialogue cluster, that brain trust, which some of them were here today, and, uh, and the Men's Health Network at the sort of the lead, it's like, you know, this is, I can't get any better than this. This is a group that wants to do this. And I stayed with that through, our funding lasted through last June. Uh, and during that time period, we actually implemented and started the, uh, our coalition, uh, for um, Native Male Health Coalition, uh, the Warrior's Journey to Wellness, we titled it, which is sort of a, a loose-knit coalition under the Men's Health Network rubric. And uh, one of the ladies who was in the contract with me with me Office of Minority Health has continued. Uh, and Leo Nolan, who's a former IHSer, a Mohawk Indian who worked in external uh, intergovernmental affairs for the IHS for many, many years. Uh, the three of us have been, as you know, sort of the most active people in the coalition and we've been volunteers for 10 months because we believe in this and think we, we don't want to see it die on the vine. So that's sort of, in a nutshell, do we need that Office of Indian Men's Health? Definitely. I think we, we need also Office of Men's Health and HHS. We needed it at NIH, but I think starting it there where there's a legislative mandate is probably the best, one of the best places to start because I think we might even be able to leverage for some of the resources if we work at it. And it is unquestionably needed, as is the Office of Women's Health. Uh, but there is vestiges of women's programs. More than that, maternal and child health has been a mainstay because that's, you know, women are the gatekeepers to family health, as everybody knows. So we're not about competing against them. In fact, they're very strong supporters of the need to deal with male health because the theme that has come through over and over is that we cannot have healthy Indian families as the Men's Health Network advocates for all men and their families, is that you can't have healthy families if the men are in, in horrible states of health physically and emotionally and spiritually and everything else and in an Indian country. It has been just very devastating what the, the state they're in and its impact on, the, on Indian families and communities. Great. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Can you tell me a little bit more about your work with the coalition and some of the things that you've learned and some of the things that you've worked on with the coalition? Yes, I think the coalition is, it's been a breath of fresh air to not to be in the federal government where every time you turn around you're stepping on some regulation or you have to get clearance which is timely, uh, or not timely, it's, it's timeless almost. It's like things get stuck and you end up not being able to act on things. So we have been able to, uh, as part of the initial uh, task order that we've been able to keep going by volunteerism. We've had our webinar series, which you have been part of the sponsor. Initially, it was a Office of Minority Health, uh, but it also pulled in SAMHSA and Mose Hearn of the Indian Health Service uh, has agreed to sort of coordinate it because uh, they have the facilities and the capability IT-wise to, to broadcast them. 
And we've had this series of webinars that I think have been profoundly awareness building, which was the intent of them, starting with an overview last June of the magnitude of the, of the problems of American Indian Alaska men, and uh, in terms of all the things I've already shared about, you know, two to five hundred percent greater mortality from these different problems. Um, and that was followed by one that started looking at best practices and ways that we have uh, things that are happening in the community that, that seem to have promise. And in the case of the Boys and Girls Club, they had very compelling data about you know, Indian-specific Boys and Girls Clubs initiative that have increased graduation rates, have increased grade point average of kids in the program, I mean, that's pretty hard outcomes data. If you can show that you've kept kids in school and got better grades, I mean, what's not the love about that? I mean, that's, that, that's, that is, that's, worth, that's golden. Uh, that's highly cost effective long term. I mean, you just track that long term and that's kids that are productive and working and not in jail uh, or not dead from suicide or alcohol overdose or crashes. So, um, and then we had a follow up one um, with Billy Mills, the Olympic uh, gold medalist from the 1964 Olympic 10,000 meters, uh, who is an incredible role model for Indian people. He's an Oglala Sioux. Uh, I'd met him many years ago because uh, he's from Pine Ridge. He was raised uh, by foster parents, I think a, an uncle or something, because I think both his parents died of alcoholism. Um, and it's a very compelling story. It's actually a movie, Running Brave by Robbie Benson, about his sort of struggles to overcome sort of the the, the problems of, of what he grew up with, the historical trauma with his family, uh, but, a, but ultimately the loving family that was very important to him and his triumph in, in the Olympics and what he's meant to Indian people ever since in terms of giving it back, being a motivational speaker, an entrepreneur, uh, a philanthropist, and a spokesperson for Indian wellness and health. And uh, so we had that, and then just a couple days ago uh, we had the one on family support and the importance of family and, and fatherhood with Al Pooley who is half Navajo, half Hopi, and then a, a northern or a, I think a northern Cheyenne named, uh, blocking on his name right now, Mr. Small, Dr. Small, uh, Clayton Small of the uh, Indian Pride program and uh, this very compelling uh, community-based interventions that are showing results with young people and adults, and it's multi-generational, um, recognize the importance of family and, and what the role of the father is and the importance of fathers and mothers and, and whole families in, in preserving tradition and living, living in both worlds, you know, how to be a warrior in today's uh, in environment uh, in respecting the traditions of the past but with the reality of what's going on right now and, and how families can you know cope with that and uh, we have a lot to celebrate in terms of things that are emerging that are promising I think. You mentioned some of the really um, dramatic disparities mm -hmm. for American Indian and Alaska mm -hmm. Native men and boys. Mm -hmm. Could you tell me about any other initiatives or opportunities that you see for raising awareness of those mm -hmm. and then addressing those? Yeah, I think there's some that are emerging right now, and I think our conference that we had today sort of shined the light on, on, on several of them. But I would start with what I think probably the greatest opportunity, the, the things that I think is the most encouraging, is the Indian men that I see emerging as leaders at all levels that I didn't see very often the first 25 years of my career. But there's been this sort of uh, explosion of awareness about the importance of, m of men being better role models, parents, and it's all age groups. I mean, it's men who are older who are in recovery. I've met numerous men who are champions for this who have been clean and sober for 20 years or more. And then there's an, a generation of younger people who are trained, and it's, I can truthfully say the first 15, 20 years of my career, I had wonderful mentors, Indian and white, but of the Indian side, I would say 80 to 90 percent of them were women. And then in the mid part of my career, I was mentoring Indian people, and I would say 80 to 90 percent of them were Indian women, because those are the ones that had the training and seemed to have the knowledge, skills, and discipline uh, and commitment to things. But the last 10 or 15 years, uh, 
the, the Indian men that I've met, I've mentored some. Some of them have been important teachers to me. It's just like I don't know if there's that many more or then I'm just more aware, I'm looking for them. But I believe there's more of them. I believe that the spirit is, is coming out. And I think that is probably the most important thing because a lot of it is at the grassroots level and it makes me very committed to make sure we tell their story, that we get their programs evaluated, that we share them with other people so that in the end that we maximize the utility from the hard work and the creativity that they've invested so much in. Uh, and I think that, that that's probably the, the, the greatest resource right now. On top of that, I would say certainly my affiliation with the Men's Health Network and the coalition that, we have, that we're building uh, across racial groups, because many of the issues, I believe most of the male health issues are universal. I think they're, they're expressed differently in cultures and the way you deal with them have to be culturally tailored. But the truth is men are behaving fairly consistently when they're marginalized people anywhere in the world. And so I think there's a great you know, translational opportunity of what works one place can be tailored with cultural uh, sensitivity to work in others. And so I think the, the Men's Health Network is sort of at the epicenter of making this happen. And so that's why I'm so, so excited to be part of it. Uh, and then the notion that we have this My Brother's Keeper hitting right now, and I think the Obama administration and Obama personally wanting this to be sort of a legacy issue for him. Uh, I was very disappointed initially that they really, were very little, I mean, I had to ask and call, and it took about two or three hours to even find out whether Indians were included, because I couldn't see it written any place. I could see males of color, young boys and young men of color, and as one Indian person told me, it's like, well, given we can call a, a team a redskin, doesn't that qualify us automatically as males of color? Uh, and it's like, I would sure think so. And I finally got through to the person who, in fact, is coordinating it just a couple of weeks ago. And uh, Leo Nolan, uh, my ex-IHS compadre and uh, member of our coalition, and I had a meeting with Bill Mendoza and Ron Lassard. And you have a neat combination of people there. You have this young rising star, a dramatically, strikingly attractive, tall, fit, Oglala Sioux man who is probably late 30s, about the age of my son, my daughter was born at Pine Ridge. He, they were born the same year at Pine Ridge, I found out. Uh, he's the leader and his chief of staff is Ron Lossard, who's somebody who's about my age, who is a sage Indian guy who's been around and he has sort of a soft wisdom about him and between the two you have I think a pretty powerful team will be strong advocates for Indians and so that was just so affirming to know that we have I think potentially a strong team carrying the sort of the, the water and the in the banner for the Indian component of this because I was afraid it was going to be lost because it was the press virtually ignored that Indians and if you look at any of the measures high school dropout rate substance abuse rate suicide homicide particularly on reservations, it's as bad as any place, if not worse. Su suicide, it's the worst. And, uh, and we heard about it from Ben O'Dell today that we're in fact, you know, there's opportunities to sort of nudge this in different directions. And so seeing two men who are leading this that sort of fit this new model of Indian men that were very dedicated, who are capable and, and committed, um, sort, of, sort of furthered my optimism that in fact this is an opportunity that won't, won't get lost. Um, and then the other one that is emerging, and I brought it up today, is this notion that we are changing of the guard and leadership at the National Institute um, for, Moni for Minority Health. It's a National Institute on Minority Health and Health Disparities. And coming right at a time when this we're tooling up with my brother's keeper, and there has never been a focus of any magnitude. There's never been a lead or a person who's focused on men's health. And the name of this institute, which is only like less than two years old, is Minority Health and Health Disparities. And the gender health disparities are there in all racial groups, and they're even more intensified in some of the males of color. So it cannot possibly meet its goals and objectives if it ignores male, the male side of these disparities any longer. And so I think the whole notion of trying to push with the new leadership that's going to come on board there can't ignore males any longer. We need we did a research project as part of the initiative with the Office of Minority Health where we looked at, did a literature review, everything we could find about interventions around men's health, 
trying to understand the, the nature of, uh, of these disparities, it's almost non-existent. That research has been virtually ignored. And so the term that I sort of coined that I, I'm not even sure where I heard it at, one of our former directors has used it, it's this benign neglect of men. And when we wrote our paper, uh, the Men's Health Network, on the spinoff of the first dialogue meeting, I wanted in there that this, you know, this benign neglect represents the single largest, most, most uh, dramatic public health problem that's been ignored the longest, that affects more people than anything else, and that it, you know, it's time to change that. And so uh, I, I see that Office of uh, On Minority Health and uh, Health Disparities as a unique opportunity to sort of turn turn focus towards male health, because I think the, my brother's keeper, when they start looking at a lot of these things, they'll see there's a lot of holes in the data. We have not looked at male health. And you know, I believe in women's health absolutely, but the truth is that women would not tolerate if they had a 500% greater uh, carnage on suicide, they would, they would know how to flex their political muscle the women's group and, and and focus attention on that. I think men's have to learn. The men's groups have to learn how women women's health movement has gained uh, a footing and gotten resources, as the AIDS group has, as many others. But the men have not stood up for themselves, and you know maybe the best way to do it is when they realize the importance of fatherhood and being around for their kids. Maybe that'll be more motivation than their own, than their own health. I'm not sure, but. Uh, and, and, and closely related to that notion of better research is uh, I've been doing a fair amount of work. Uh, my son's doing an Eagle Scout project on uh, suicide prevention in Scout Age kids because it's the number two cause of death for Scout Age boys across the country, with whites being second only to uh, uh, Indians in terms of uh, suicide rates. And in some of that research, I've been looking at. Uh, a colleague and friend who's helping with my son's project who believes the sort of warrior psychology and social uh, networking models have profound implications for how we deal with men's health. And, his, and it's underpinned by the work of Steven Pinker, the Harvard uh, evolutionary psychologist who wrote a book that's fairly popular now, but it's, it's an incredible academic uh, success as well as a popular one. It's called the better, the better Angels of Our Nature, and it looks at why violence has been decreasing in society since the dawn of time, uh, since, since we've become more organized, which is, in ways, it's hard to believe that, it, you know, certainly it isn't gone. But he has very compelling data about during the hunter and gathering era of our existence, prehistory into early history, the carnage from brutality and fighting that men experienced naturally selected out uh, an interest in, in being very inquisitive about other people. They, you, if you got lost in the wilderness, you didn't ask a stranger how to get home because it would be more than likely get you killed. It was a, a brutal time. The, the, the proportion of the population that was killed in combat was outrageous. And over time, men as the warriors, hunters, gatherers, learned to work in groups and to trust only people that looked like, looked like you and that you knew and people that had your back. And it's basically transferred right day to, to military models, whether it's Navy SEALs or anything else. That's imprinted in our DNA, according to, to Pinker and to uh, uh, Paul Quinnett, the suicide uh, researcher who believes this model works. And the basic significance of this is that men don't trust folks and will not ask help from, help from folks that they don't know or trust that don't look like them. They will avoid, avoid that like a plague. And if you look at the research, it pretty much confirms that if you're trying to get men to ask for help, it's almost a failure. The successes where we have had men doing it is where you either get their wives to muscle men to doing it, which the Men's Health Network has been very skilled at uh, assisting, or if you get people who are they perceive as peers to offer help, because men will accept help from people, they rarely ask for it. And so the new model needs to be how do we get, how do we offer help from people who are credible and believable and trustworthy enough that men will accept it. And what we heard from some of the people today who have these programs on the uh, healthy starts are exactly those models. You get people who 
are in the community who look like them, they're community members, and they reach out and they offer assistance to these men and then sort of nudge them along. Al Pooley with the Indian interventions he's doing, you've developed a relationship first and then you start talking about fatherhood and then you start talking about mental health and, and good fathers are around to take care of their kids. Um, that's the model that works and uh, we need to do more of that. We need to be much more skilled in it. We need much more research to show what are the, some of the subtleties of that. How do you do it in a way that's more consistently successful and I think that's where you know the institutes at NIH need to start investing time and energy around all all the health problems that, that plague men from the certainly the behavioral health sides are huge but all the way to diabetic control you name it it's like the men have some of the worst problems on all those things cardiovascular disease diabetes they're non-compliers with all their problems they underutilize services why because men don't ask for help men buy more GPS's and the other interesting sort of spin-off of this is that if you you think about the, this sort of caveman psychology or warrior psychology, it's like, wow, are we that primitive? It's like, well, maybe. But some of the solution may in fact be high tech because that same notion of not trusting strangers has guided men to buy more GPSs, to use search engines more, and the internet and ways of getting information that's anonymous and safe, where you don't have to trust a stranger have great appeal for men and it fits the psychology of you know not trusting strangers so using automation and, and you know apps and stuff for, so men can get information that will serve them well probably has great potential we just need to know how to sort of tailor it to their to their taste and I think uh, you know technology could help us come out of the cave you know <laughs> so I think those are the things I see on the rise and I haven't given up on the office of Indian men's health I think if Indian people ask for it enough and demand it, we're going to give a presentation at the Native uh, Health Research Conference this year uh, talking about these issues. Uh, I did it two years ago. They didn't have funding for it last year. Um, the sequestration messed up a lot of things. It cut short our, I think, our contract from the Office of Minority Health to con continue this. So funding has been a problem for sure. But, you know, the notion of a good idea when you get a critical mass, the whole notion of a tipping point or whatever model, um, I think we're almost there with men's health and that's the most exciting thing and, uh, and it keeps me going. It's the one thing that I want to turn the cur on, curve on in terms of uh, my career in Indian country is to know that I've, you know, did everything in my power to see those death rates from suicide and overall death rates for Indian men and their families to turn. And I, it's pivotal. I don't think it can turn for their families unless it turns for them. And, uh, and that's, that's, that's what I'm about. And uh, I, I hope I got some gas in, in the tank to finish it. But uh, uh, as we said today, a lot of this stuff, it'll be our grandkids that'll see the benefits of it. But if we don't do it now, they won't see it. So I think that's, you got, you got to think long term. I mean, Indians have this notion that you need to think seven generations ahead. I think that's a useful model. If you keep that in mind, um, you're always looking ahead. And they also have a reverence for the past and their ancestors. And one of the things I had one guy told me is like, would your grandfathers be proud of what you're doing today? And it's like, wow, that, that's pretty heavy. You know, I had a great grand, two great grandfathers, and it's like because I, they meant so much to me, I, I never really thought about you know, are they looking down on me now, and how am I doing in that? But I mean. Indians look, a lot of Indian people look at things that way in terms of ahead for their kids and back for their, their grandparents and their, their relatives and, and how am I doing in the context of that. They, they've lost some of that, particularly the men's from the pain and suffering. Like I say, we don't know why they suffer so much more than the women. It's been hypothesized that colonization and loss of roles uh, was more devastating to them. And you can see the women have always had the, the role of raising the kids. Uh, but for a hunter-gatherer group, and if you look at where the biggest problems are on the plains of the Dakotas and Montana, the northern tier by and large, that's where the worst health disparities are, that's where the suicide rates are the highest, the alcohol death rates, you name it. Those are the ones that lost the most of sort of what their essence was about in terms of nomadic hunters, warriors, and purpose. And when you lose purpose, you feel worthless and when you feel worthless you commit suicide and so when these Indian people on these national health interview surveys say I feel hopeless and I feel worthless 
we got to believe them because their suicide rate suggests that they mean it in the deepest sense. Um, and I, I think hopelessness and helplessness is where we have to start. And we may have to start with the kids to prevent them from ever getting in that spot. As so many people said today, we got to start it now. We cannot drag our feet any longer. And uh, that's, that's sort of my message and mantra. We got, we got to start it now and, and keep slugging. So, Rick, could you tell me why you think this um, Office of Indian Men's Health is so important and what issues do you think we have the potential to address with that office? Well, I mean, I think it's critically important because it has been the most long-standing neglected aspect of Indian health and I don't think without specific focus that's tailored at men we're going to make the inroads we need and when you look at where the health disparities are where we're talking about two to five hundred percent greater death rates for suicide, homicide, HIV, unintentional injuries, firearms, and alcohol-related deaths, um, that requires a male-focused intervention. And without it, I don't think it's going to happen. So I think it's critical that the IHS make the initial investment, even if it's only you know one and a half FTEs, you get the right person in there who can work out of an entrepreneurial model and look across agencies and get them to ante up, especially with the with the My Brother's Keeper initiative emerging, I think it's a, a ripe time to pull in a lot of players, including the private sector, in the in the resources that are that have already been sort of anteed up for the My Brother's Keeper. Uh, Nike has been a, a contributor in Indian Country, so it's it's a it's a unique opportunity to capitalize on several things converging at once. This My Brother's Keeper initiative, um, and do something about male health and the fact that we have so many emerging Indian men who are champions for this, there's people at the local level that can carry it. So I think that's that's the greatest opportunity uh, we've had in years in, in having an office to sort of be the clearinghouse, sort of like what the Men's Health Network does for the nation to do that in Indian country and to be a, a vital component of your network as well. Okay. Thank you. Mm -hmm.